Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Weary Weekly History and Entertainment News. As winter draws to a close, there's more activities going on outside. On this episode, I'll be reviewing events going on at the Berkshire Theatre Group and the Mahewi, plus giving a discussion on how America's pastime baseball has a deep connection to Pittsfield and giving an update on Wakona Park. First, it's time for this episode's trivia question. This episode's question is, how many teams have called Wakona Park home? Now, for this episode's local headlines. Our first stop will be to the Berkshire Theater Group for a unique show with Andy Gross. Prepared to be amazed and entertained by the unparalleled talents of Andy Gross, a triple threat performer who seamlessly blends comedy, magic, and ventriloquism, creating an unforgettable evening of laughter and intrigue. With over one billion online views of his viral videos, Andy Gross has become a sensation with some of the most recognized magic videos ever seen. His live shows are hailed as some of the best touring comedy spectacles, comedy magic spectacles today, consistently selling out venues and amassing a devoted following. His performances, which merge stand-up comedy, mind-bending magic, and remarkable ventriloquism have earned him acclaim among his peers and audiences alike. This performance will be going on March 9th, starting at 7.30 p.m. Visit the website shown here for more information. We will be staying in Pittsfield for our next story. The Pittsfield Anthenaeum's twice a year book sale will be taking place in March. If you are interested in books, CDs, or movies, this is a great place to purchase them. This sale is one of Pittsfield's most popular events. The sale will be going on Thursday, March 7th from 3 to 7 p.m., Friday, March 8th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., and Saturday, March 9th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Thursday's sale is for members of Friends of the Anthenaeum only. If you want to become a member, you can do so at the door. Please note that parking tends to get very, very hectic. If you can get there as early as possible, please do so. Our next story takes us to the Mahewi Theater in Great Barrington for a concert. First, for some background. In his dance suites, J.S. Bach ventures into Spanish grenades, French bourriers, and other British music. He and family members delighted in arranging Celtic and Scottish folk music. The band Marcakis will be performing this music. They will also be performing Beethoven and Haydn, who also forayed into Irish folk music with their own arrangements. Macaris formed in 2018 to explore the broad musical heritage of Scotland, and the following year released its first disc, Whips in the Dell, to critical international acclaim. According to Music Web International, it was, quote, absolutely wonderful. 
one of the very best releases of 2019. They got their name Marker because it was a royal court troubadour of medieval Scotland, and the program provides a lush sampling from the ensemble's collection. The musicians are Fiona Gispelli as soprano, Caitlin Heads on violin, Ben Mattis on iris whistle, bassoon and bagpipes, Elliot Fig on harpsichord and organ, Kiwi Khan Lipman on cello, Doug Balliot on bass, Liv Castor on harp, and Paul Morton on thermidor and guitar. This concert will be going on March 17th. Visit the website shown here for more information. Our next stop takes us to North Adams, where Mass Mocha and the North Adams Public Library will be holding a collaborative event. Join Mass Mocha's Research and Development Store and the North Adams Public Library for a free reading, conversation, and book signing with Andre Dubis III the best-selling author of Townie, reflecting on a life of challenges, contradictions, and fulfillments. Andre Dubis III is the author of Such Kindness and eight other bestsellers, including Townie, a memoir, and House of Sand and Fog, a National Book Award finalist in fiction, and an Oprah's Book Club selection. He lives in Newburyport, Massachusetts. During childhood summers in Louisiana, Andre Dubis III's grandfather taught him that men work is hard. As an adult, whether tracking down a drug lord in Mexico as a bounty hunter, or grappling with privilege while living with a rich girlfriend in New York City, Dubis worked at being a better worker and a better human being. In Ghost Dogs, Dubis's nonfiction, Prowess, is on full display in his retelling of his own successes, failures, and triumphs and pain. In his longest essay, If I Owned a Gun, Dubis reflects on the empowerment and shame he felt in keeping a gun and his decision ultimately to give it up. Elsewhere, he writes about a violent youth and of settled domesticity and fatherhood, about the omnipresence expectations and contradictions of masculinity, and about the things that writers remember and those they forget. Ghost Dogs renders moments of personal relevation with emotional generosity and stylistic grace, ultimately standing as a sense of witness and testimony to the art of the essay. This event will be going on March 21st. It will be taking place at the North Adams Public Library, which is located at 74th Church Street. Visit MassMocha.org for more information. Our next story takes us to the Foundry in West Stockbridge for a concert with System Exclusive. The Foundry is a concert venue it hasn't been talked about a lot here on WWHEN. System exclusive are Ari Bialstil and Matt Jones, a Pasadena, California duo bearing an army full of mini synths and a pocket full of Tarantino dusted riffs who make heart-dropping capital P pop 
punts with more of a hint of post-punk. They rented their home, packed their bags, and for the last two years, have been touring across the world relentlessly, building a loyal fan base in true grit, rock and roll fashion, delivering their visceral and fun, high octane dazzling show night after night. This concert is scheduled for March 16th, March 16th at 7.30 p.m. Parking is limited at the venue, so please utilize the free public parking lots in town. One is across from the post office, one is behind Berkshire Bank, and the other is just off Main Street. They are clearly marked. Foundry does not recommend parking at the Tuck Orient Express restaurant or the post office, or you might get it, receive a ticket. The Foundry is located on 2 Harris Street in West Stockbridge. It's now time for this episode's movie portion of WWATN. This episode's film is the 2020 horror film, The Invisible Man. In this movie, Cecilia Cass is attempting to move on with her life. After the death of her abusive ex, Adrian Griffin. After a series of unexplained events, Cecilia comes to believe that Adrian, a brilliant scientist specializing in optics, is not in fact dead, but has discovered a way to turn himself invisible and gaslight her. That said, Adrian has left Cecilia a significant amount of money in his will, but she can only obtain it by proving that she's mentally competent to his estate's executor. Trying to convince the authorities that a supposedly dead man is harassing her through advanced technology is not helping her case. So why do I love this movie? It's everything a great horror film has. The scares are really good, the film itself builds nicely, and it's not gory at all. I'm not a gory horror fan, I'm more of a psychological scare person, and The Invisible Man is a perfect example of that. However, its biggest asset is Elizabeth Moss's performance as Cecilia. She is great showing how weak Cecilia is at first, but then shows the strength that she gains during the movie. It's now time for a unique story here on WWHEN. As the spring starts, spring training and baseball are happening. As a result of this, it's time to look into one of the most controversial stories in baseball and how Berkshire County may have had an influence in it. One of the most confusing aspects to baseball is where baseball was actually invented. Since the National Baseball Hall of Fame opened in 1939, it became the mecca for all those who play and follow the sport. So much so that the name of the upstate New York town where the hall is located and was invented by General Abner Doubleday in 1839 and whose financial stability is predicated on the museum drawing in tourists has become synonymous with it with players on track for induction often being labeled as on, quote, the path to Cooperstown. The only problem? Abner Doubleday had nothing to do with inventing baseball. And the game 
didn't originate in Cooperstown. In other words, the Hall of Fame is built on a lie. The origins of the myth that Abner Doubleday invented baseball in Cooperstown can be traced back to the early 20th century. When, when there was strong debate as to whether baseball directly descended from British games like rounders and cricket. The sports writer Henry Chadwick was, an, was a proponent of this idea, writing in 1903 that, quote, there is no doubt whatever as to baseball having originated from the two century old English game of rounders, end quote. The baseball establishment at the time including sports good magnet turned Chicago Cubs owner Albert Spaulding and the presidents of both the National and American League, seeing monetary value in the idea that baseball was a patriotic game, so-called invented by Americans in America, sought to discredit Chadwick and those like him. Spalding announced the formation of a commission to investigate baseball's beginnings and asked anyone for, who supposed information on how the sport came to be to provide it. Oddly enough, Chadwick and Spalding are in the Hall of Fame, and as stated, the Hall of Fame itself is in Cooperstown, but Abner Doubleday is nowhere to be seen. So how does Pitchfield play into all of this? In 2004, baseball historian John Thorne found a document from 1793 that city officials passed. This document was a game changer for baseball, as shown here. It stated, quote, for the preservation of windows in the new meeting house, no person and inhabitant of said town shall be permitted to play any game called wicket, cricket, baseball, or any other game or games within the distance of 80 yards, end quote. Pittsfield was ecstatic. Could the mystery of baseball's origins finally have been solved? Reality was more complicated. With all this said, this version of the sport probably didn't resemble modern baseball except in the vaguest way. For instance, the bat, the ball, the terms of fielders, the terms of outs, and varied wildly across place and time. These variations were critical to the development of what we know as baseball is today, but contrary to legend, the general consensus is that the modern game of baseball wasn't born in any one place or any singular moment but probably developed slowly over time. It will probably forever remain a mystery of baseball's origins. But it's nice to know that Pittsfield possibly played a role. Speaking of baseball, it's also time for an update on Wakona Park in Pittsfield. As I have stated in the past on WWHEN, Wakona Park has been going through a series of changes. The city's historical commission will take on a conversation about Wakona Park following a request from the State Historical Commission to preserve its original structure. The current grandstand was constructed in the 1950s and was the fourth iteration. It has been condemned due to safety and structural issues, with, among other things, asbestos in the metal panel cladding and roof and the steel 
needing remediation and repair. The city has a preservation restriction on the building, meaning that the building and the site are on the National Register of Historic Places, and the Mass Historical Commission's involvement comes into play when there are state permits needed for the project. A statement of support from the local commission might be of assistance. The panel agreed to have the conversation at a later meeting. There was some late breaking news that could not reach this episode, but stay tuned for the next episode for more information. Wakona Park also brings us the answer to this episode's trivia question. As a reminder, this episode's question was, how many teams have called Wakona Park home? The answer is 17. The first team to play at Wakona Park were the Pittsfield Electrics, who only played there for two years. After five years of no teams due to World War I, the Pittsfield Hillies played there from 1919 to 1930. The combination of the Great Depression and World War II saw another long pause. It wasn't until 1941 when another team called the Electrics played there. They played there for 10 years and had three names, Electrics, Indians, and Phillies. Another long break happened between 1951 and 1965. Afterwards, Pittsfield joined the Eastern League. Their teams had five versions. Red Sox, Rangers, Senators, Rangers, Berkshire Brewers, and Cubs. Then, beginning in 1989, they had their longest running team in the Pittsfield Mets of the New York Penn League from 1989 to 2000, before being renamed the Astros for their final season in 2001. This marked the last minor league affiliated team. Ever since then, Pittsfield teams have been either summer league or independent league. It started with the Berkshire Black Bears beginning in 2002, followed by the Pittsfield Dukes and, briefly, the American Defenders. For two years, the Pittsfield Colonials played in the Canadian American League. Currently, the Pittsfield Suns are the most recent version. They have played in the Future League since 2012. That ends this episode of Weary Weekly History and Entertainment News. If you would like to watch this or any other WWHEN episode again, you can visit Pittsfield TV's and CTSB TV's websites shown here or visit NBCTC's Facebook page. Also, if you would like to see the episodes in HD quality, make sure to check out my YouTube page at RT Weary. Thank you.